In the vast and haunting landscapes of rural Bavaria, there exists a tale that has sent shivers down the spines of generations, a chilling enigma that continues to confound investigators and captivate the minds of true crime enthusiasts. It is a tale of darkness and horror woven into the very fabric of an isolated farming community. Welcome to the bone-chilling tale of the Hinterkaifeck farm murders. In the tranquil year of 1922, nestled amidst rolling hills and whispering forests, the Gruber family lived a seemingly ordinary existence on their secluded farmstead. Andres and Kazilia Gruber, their widowed daughter Victoria, and her two young children, Kazilia and Joseph, shared an idyllic, albeit reclusive, life within the confines of their secluded abode an additional member resided, a maid who contributed to the farm's daily operations. Yet, unbeknownst to them, an ominous presence was lurking, waiting to tear apart the fragile tranquilly they held dear. It was in the spring of 1922 when the Gruber family vanished without a trace, swallowed whole by the sinister hands of the unknown. Their absence would not go unnoticed for their neighbors, curious and concerned, ventured to the farm to uncover the truth. What they discovered was beyond comprehension, a tableau of unspeakable horrors that defied all reason. As the door creaked open, a scene of unspeakable carnage revealed itself. The lifeless bodies of Andreas, Casilia, Victoria, her two innocent children, and their maid, Maria, lay brutally bludgeoned, their eyes forever fixed in a haunting stare. The mystery deepened further as investigators soon realized that this was no simple act of violence, but a meticulously planned execution with an intruder dwelling within the farm for days before the grisly massacre took place. The sinister events that unfolded on that remote homestead would become known as the Hinterkaifeck farm murders, etching their mark on history as one of the most baffling and enduring unsolved cases to date. Even today, the identity of the killer or killers remains a mystery. The lack of suspects and the brutality of the killings have led to countless theories and speculations over the years. Was it the work of a vengeful neighbor, a malevolent stranger, or something even more sinister lurking in the shadows of the German countryside? The year was 1922, a time of great upheaval and change. The world was still reeling from the aftermath of World War I and Europe was struggling to rebuild itself. Nestled in the Bavarian town of Groban, the Hinterkaifeck farm was a secluded and isolated farmstead that was home to the Gruber family. The farmhouse, which dates back to the mid 19th century, was surrounded by fields and woodland. The nearest neighbors were several hundred meters away and the farm was only accessible through a long, narrow road that led through the fields. Privacy was virtually guaranteed in this idyllic retreat, but the very isolation that offered solace also meant that screams or cries for help could easily be swallowed by the vast expanse. The Gruber family, living amidst this serenity, had forged a self-sufficient existence. They grew their own sustenance, tended to their animals, and seldom strayed beyond the farm's boundaries, reserving their outings solely for Sunday church services. Hinterkaifeck Farm became a sanctuary of tranquility, a place where the family sought solace and attempted to rebuild their shattered lives in the wake of the devastating First World War. However, despite the idyllic setting, the Grubers led a reclusive lifestyle that often raised eyebrows among their neighbors. The family seldom ventured into the village, preferring the solitude and self-sufficiency of their secluded existence. Notorious for their scandalous reputation, the Grubers faced disdain from the neighboring townsfolk. The community harbored knowledge of the accusations and subsequent convictions levied against Andres and Victoria for engaging in an incestuous relationship believed to have resulted in the birth of Joseph. Consequently, Andreas had served a year-long jail sentence, while Victoria had been sentenced to a month. The family's disrepute kept them withdrawn, with only Victoria and her daughter Casilia occasionally venturing into town. Thus, if the family happened to be absent from the town sites for several days, it would raise no alarm, let alone suspicions of foul play. Sinister events 
plagued the tranquil surroundings of Hinterkaifeck, casting an eerie shadow over the unsuspecting family. In the months leading up to the horrifying attack, a series of strange incidents unfolded, foretelling a gruesome fate. The first clue to the impending horror emerged six months prior, when the family maid abruptly fled. Whispers spread, revealing that she departed after hearing otherworldly sounds reverberating from the attic, convinced that the house itself was haunted. But that was just the beginning. The enigma deepened when Andreas Gruber stumbled upon a mysterious newspaper from Munich on the property in March 1922. Puzzled, he could not recall purchasing it and initially suspected the postman's carelessness. Yet no one in the vicinity subscribed to such a paper, unraveling the bewildering nature of its presence. As the days inched closer to the massacre, unease coursed through Gruber's veins. He confided in his neighbors, recounting his shocking discovery of fresh tracks leading from the nearby forest to a broken door lock in a farm's machine room. Something sinister lurked just beyond their doorstep, invading their sanctuary. Then, when night cast its inky veil upon the land, unsettling footsteps echoed from the attic, creeping into their very souls. Gruber searched the entire building, but to his bewilderment, he found no intruder. Fear and suspicion tightened their grip, urging him to share his chilling experiences with others. Yet, stubbornly, he refused assistance, keeping the details hidden from the prying eyes of law enforcement. According to a school friend of seven-year-old Kazilia Gabrielle, the seven-year-old girl added a chilling twist to the unfolding tale. The young child revealed that her mother, Victoria, had fled the farm on the eve of the tragedy following a violent quarrel. Hours later, she was discovered trembling in the depths of the nearby forest, her whereabouts and harrowing journey shrouded in darkness. Then, on that fateful day, March 31st, 1922, a seemingly innocuous Friday afternoon, Maria Baumgartner, the new maid, arrived at the farm. Her sister, who accompanied her, bid her farewell, unaware that she would be the last person to set eyes on the family alive. As nightfall painted the sky with its haunting hues, an unknown force enticed Victoria Gabrielle, her daughter Kazilia, and her parents, Andreas and Kazilia, to the barn. They were unknowingly walking into their doom, one step at a time. Inside the barn, the merciless killer struck, armed with a chilling mattock stolen from the very heart of the family's livelihood. Each member met a grisly fate, one crushing blow to the head after another. Silence settled over the desecrated barn, shrouding the horrific scene that had unfolded. But the malevolence did not end there. The ruthless perpetrator, driven by a chilling determination, ventured further into the once peaceful homestead. Within the confines of the living quarters, he continued his macabre dance of death, wielding the same murderous tool. Helpless infant Joseph, cradled in his bassinet, and the new maid, Maria Baumgartner, sleeping innocently in her bedchamber, were robbed of their lives, joining the tragic chorus of the fallen. By April 4th, the Gruber family had vanished from sight, yet signs of activity lingered at the farmstead, unbeknownst to the onlookers. These were not the doings of the family members. On April 1st, a skilled artisan named Michel Plockel noticed wisps of smoke rising from the chimney, accompanied by the mysterious presence of a lantern bearing figure outside, though their identity eluded him. That same day, coffee sellers Hans Shirovsky and Eduard Shirovsky arrived in Hinterkaifeck to fulfill an order. Their attempts to reach the Gruber household were met with silence. They ventured around the yard, only to find it empty. The gate to the machine house caught their attention as it stood wide open, a peculiar detail they couldn't ignore. Eventually, they departed, puzzled and unsettled. Meanwhile, Kazilia Gabriel, a school attendee, failed to provide any explanation for her absence, and the entire family failed to appear for Sunday worship, further raising suspicions in the community. The following night, farmer and butcher Simon Ray Blander caught sight of two strangers near the forest's edge who hastily retreated as he approached. Suspicions began to stir on April 3rd when the postman, delivering mail, discovered untouched letters from Saturday. The following day, repairman Albert Hofner arrived at the farm to fix an engine in the machine room. Despite the absence of any family members, he noticed the locked barn doors and the persistent barking of the family dog within. Initially, Albert paid little mind to the peculiar scene, 
Taking advantage of the open machine room, he proceeded with his repairs. Several hours later, as he prepared to leave, he encountered an unsettling sight. The barn door stood ajar, and the previously barking dog was now tied up outside, all without a trace or sound from the family during his work. Upon returning to town, Albert shared his unnerving experience with Lorenz Schlittenbauer, the local guide. Concern gnawed at them both, as neither had laid eyes on the family. As a result, they resolved to visit the farm, accompanied by two friends, around 3.30 p.m. Upon arrival, they discovered locked doors and the absence of any signs of life within the house. Venturing into the barn, drawn by its open door, their grim discovery awaited them. A haunting sight of Andreas, Kazelia, Victoria, and young Kazelia's lifeless bodies stacked upon each other, shrouded in hay. Driven by desperation, Lorenz meticulously examined each body, hoping for signs of life. Yet the youngest, Joseph, was nowhere to be found amidst the pile of bludgeoned corpses. In a frantic search, Lorenz darted into the home through an adjoining hallway, only to stumble upon the bloodied and motionless bodies of Maria and Joseph in the bassinet. Hours later, Inspector George Riengruber from the Munich Police Department arrived to launch the investigation, though he had to endure a grueling 45-mile journey to reach the scene. In small towns, news, especially of a gruesome murder, spreads far faster than the pace at which the police can arrive. Disturbingly, numerous reports emerge of curious townsfolk trampling through the crime scene, tampering with evidence, and even indulging in meals while present. A post-mortem examination conducted the following day unveiled the gruesome truth. The family had met their demise at the hands of a mattock or pickaxe. Most chillingly, all but young Kazelia had perished instantly. Their lives were abruptly ended by savage blows to the heads. Kazilia, however, endured for hours after the assault, succumbing to the shock and horror of witnessing her family's massacre. Her agony was so intense that she resorted to tearing out her own hair in her final moments. The following day, autopsies were performed on the bodies, revealing the horrifying truth. With the evidence collected at the scene and interviews conducted with neighbours, the police gradually constructed a chilling timeline. Confirmation from Maria Baumgartner's sister established that Maria's last day alive was on March 31st, as her sister had visited her on that very day. Further corroboration came from the mailman, who confirmed that the mail had remained undisturbed since Saturday morning. This revelation pointed to the grim truth that the Gruber family met their untimely demise on the night of March 31st. The killer or killers had somehow lured each family member, one by one, into the barn. It is speculated that they might have called out to them individually or caused a disturbance, coaxing them inside. Once inside the barn, each victim was brutally struck in the head with a pickaxe. The bodies of Victoria and her mother, Kazilia, also displayed signs of strangulation, indicating that they might have been strangled before the fatal blows were delivered, ensuring their demise. All four victims suffered multiple blows to their heads with Victoria enduring a horrifying number of strikes, up to nine, inflicted by the deadly weapon. The killer then made their way into the house, taking Maria's life in her own room. The final victim was young Joseph, who was struck just once, a single blow that ended his innocent existence. As the investigation unfolded, interviews with neighbours and the police's own inquiries unveiled a more disturbing aspect of the killer's presence. Witnesses had noticed smoke rising from the chimney in the days following the murders, and some claimed to have glimpsed one of the Grubers outside their home. The police also noted that the dog and cattle had been fed, the cows had been milked, and meals had been prepared. Whoever committed these gruesome murders had resided on the farm for several days, displaying a terrifying familiarity with its workings and routines. Lastly, during the interrogation of Albert, the repairman, the police made a startling realization. The killers had been present in the house on the day the bodies were discovered, yet nobody had noticed their departure. Were they still lurking on the premises when the authorities arrived? Could the killers be among the neighbors, blending into the community while harboring their dark secret? The unsettling questions lingered, adding to the harrowing mystery that gripped the town. Following the gruesome discovery, the police found themselves mired in a web of theories and conjectures. Allegations and speculations danced through the air like spectres. But the hard reality remained. The case remained unsolved. It seemed as if the truth had become an elusive phantom, 
forever out of reach. Among the tangled threads of this haunting tale, one man stood at the center of suspicion, Loren Schlittenbauer, who had a relationship with Victoria Gabriel following the death of his first wife, came under suspicion early on due to his suspicious actions surrounding the discovery of the bodies. When Schlittenbauer and his companions arrived at the scene, they had to force their way into the barn as all the doors were locked. However, upon finding the four bodies, Schlittenbauer mysteriously unlocked the front door with a key and entered the house alone, raising eyebrows among the onlookers. Though a key to the house had gone missing days prior to the murders, it is plausible that Schlittenbauer, being a neighbor and potentially involved with Victoria, had been entrusted with a key. When questioned about why he ventured into the house alone, risking the presence of the murderer, Schlittenbauer claimed he was searching for his son, Joseph. It is known that Schlittenbauer tampered with the bodies at the scene, potentially compromising the investigation. Local suspicion persisted due to his peculiar remarks, hinting at knowledge only the killer could possess. According to case files, Schlittenbauer was spotted visiting the demolished Hinterkaifeck in 1925 by local teacher Hans Iblaga. When asked about his purpose, Schlittenbauer chillingly revealed that the murderer's attempt to bury the family's remains in the barn had been thwarted by the frozen ground. This information was interpreted as evidence of Schlittenbauer's intimate knowledge of the murder conditions, although his familiarity with the land as a neighbor could have led to an educated guess. Another theory suggested that Schlittenbauer had murdered the family after Victoria demanded financial support for young Joseph Prior to his death in 1941, Schlittenbauer successfully sued several individuals for slander after being labeled the murderer of Hinterkaifeck. The police, burdened by a lack of concrete evidence, could not find a motive compelling enough to make an arrest. Still, accusations swirled like a storm, pointing fingers at Lorenz as the orchestrator of the heinous crimes. Faced with these accusations, Lorenz fought tirelessly in court battling slanderous claims until his death in 1941. His innocence was preserved in the eyes of the law, but the shadows of doubt continued to loom. Carl Gabriel, the husband of Victoria Gabrielle, was believed to have perished in Arras, France, during World War I, yet his body was never recovered. Speculation arose following the murders, questioning whether Carl had truly met his demise on the battlefield. Victoria, left alone, gave birth to Joseph, a child whose paternity became the subject of gossip. Rumors circulated that Joseph was the product of an incestuous relationship between Victoria and her father, Andreas, a sordid affair that had been exposed in court and became known throughout the village. The vile acts of rape committed by Andreas against his own daughter led to the conviction of both parties for incestuous relations in the aftermath of World War II, former captives from the Schrobenhausen region, prematurely released from Soviet captivity, made claims of encountering a German-speaking Soviet officer who confessed to being the murderer of Hinterkaifeck. However, some of these individuals later revised their statements, casting doubt on their credibility. Many speculated that this Soviet officer could potentially be Carl Gabriel, as witnesses who claimed to have seen him after his reported death testified that Gabriel had expressed a desire to travel to Russia. Ludwig Mixel, the astute police chief in Schrobenhausen, shared a tantalizing notion, Karl's possible return to Hinterkaifeck, driven by a desire for revenge against Victoria for her alleged incestuous relationship. The implications were astonishing, fueling speculations that sent chills down one's spine. Yet, as the layers of this intricate puzzle began to unravel, a truth emerged that shattered the illusions. The idea of Carl as the mastermind behind the killings, while intriguing, crumbled under scrutiny, revealing its implausibility. On that decisive day, December 12, 1923, a staggering nine years after Carl's passing, the Central Prosecution Office for War Losses and War Graves officially cleared him of suspicion. Their verdict left no room for doubt. Carl's demise was confirmed, and his resting place was found in the solemn embrace of Saint Laurent, Blangy, where he lay in the hallowed grounds of a comrade's tomb. The Gump brothers, particularly Adolf Gump, drew suspicion due to their affiliation with the Freecorps Oberland. As early as April 9, Adolf Gump was listed as a suspect. 
In 1951, Crescentia Meyer, the sister of Adolf and Anton Gump, made a deathbed revelation claiming that her brothers were the perpetrators of the Hinterkaifeck murders. Anton Gump was taken into police custody but was eventually released while Adolf had already passed away in 1944. The case against Anton was ultimately discontinued in 1954 due to insufficient evidence. In 1971, a woman named Therese T. penned a letter recounting an incident from her youth. At the age of 12, she witnessed her mother receiving a visit from the mother of brothers Carl and Andreas S. The woman asserted that her sons from Sattelberg were the two murderers of Hinterkaifeck. During their conversation, the mother mentioned Andres lamenting the loss of his penknife. Interestingly, a pocket knife was discovered at the farm during its demolition in 1923, but its ownership couldn't be definitively established. Nonetheless, it is possible that the knife belonged to one of the murder victims. This lead, unfortunately, yielded no substantial results. Crescens Riga, the former maid, claimed to have seen the penknife in the yard during her time of service. Peter Weber came under suspicion based on the testimony of Joseph Betts, his former co-worker. Betts revealed that Weber had mentioned a secluded farm named Hinterkaifeck, where an elderly couple lived with their daughter and her two children. Weber seemed to possess knowledge of the incestuous relationship between Gruber and his daughter. Betts further disclosed that Weber had suggested killing the old man to acquire the family's wealth. When Betts did not respond to the proposition, Weber ceased discussing it. Joseph Bartel, an inmate from a nearby asylum just 60 miles away in Gunsberg, emerged as another compelling suspect in the chilling Hinterkaifeck murders. After successfully escaping the asylum in 1921, he vanished without a trace. What's more, Bartel had a criminal history, having been apprehended for a brutal farm robbery in 1919. As soon as Inspector George Ringruber uncovered this crucial connection, he swiftly issued a warrant for Bartel's arrest, igniting an intense manhunt. However, despite the official pursuit, Bartel managed to evade capture, leaving the mystery unsolved. Crescens Riga, the former maid, held suspicions against the Bickler brothers, Anton and Karl, for their potential involvement in the murders. Anton had assisted with the potato harvest at Hinterkaifeck, granting him familiarity with the premises. Riga claimed that Anton frequently spoke to her about the Gruber and Gabrielle families and even suggested that they should be eliminated. Additionally, she recounted conversing with a stranger through her window at night, whom she believed to be Karl Bickler, Anton's brother. Riga believed that the Bickler brothers might have conspired with George Siegel, a former employee at Hinterkaifeck who was aware of the family's fortune. Siegel was suspected of breaking into the home in November 1920 and stealing several items, although he vehemently denied these allegations. However, he did admit to carving the handle of the murder weapon during his time at Hinterkaifeck and acknowledged that the tool would have been stored in the barn passage. The Thaler brothers also fell under suspicion following Crescens Riga's statement, had a history of minor burglaries in the area, which heightened concerns. Riga claimed that Joseph Thaler stood outside her window at night, inquiring about the family and their living arrangements, though she remained silent. During their conversation, Riga noticed the presence of another individual. Joseph Thaler asserted that he knew which family member slept in each room and commented on their substantial wealth. Riga observed that the stranger accompanying Thaler directed his gaze towards the machine house, an intriguing detail. Author Bill James introduced a compelling theory in his book, The Man from the Train. He proposed that a man known as Paul Muella might be responsible for the Hinterkaifeck murders. Muella had been the primary suspect in the 1897 murder of a Massachusetts family, and James's research into American newspaper archives suggested that Muella may have been a prolific serial killer, claiming numerous victims across state lines. The similarities between Muella's suspected crimes in the United States and the Hinterkaifeck murders include the extermination of entire families in remote residences, the use of a blunt farm tool as the murder weapon, the repositioning and stacking of victims' bodies, and the absence of robbery as motive. As the years wore on, Suspicion shifted from one person to another, 
casting a dark cloud of uncertainty over the small community. Over a hundred individuals fell under the scrutinizing gaze of the authorities, yet the scales of justice remained unbalanced, leaving no one to answer for the unspeakable atrocities committed on that fateful day. The lawsuit may have reached its conclusion in 1955, but its impact rippled through time, a haunting reminder of justice denied. In 2007, a glimmer of hope emerged as a determined crew of German cadets delved into the cold case, armed with cutting-edge forensic techniques. While they deemed the chances of solving the crime to be slim, they uncovered a likely culprit, a name that danced tantalizingly on their tongues. But out of respect for the suspect's family, the truth remained veiled, locked away in the depths of secrecy. Yet, as time marches on, it becomes painfully evident that the identity of the perpetrator will forever elude us. A century has passed, burying the truth beneath layers of forgotten memories and faded whispers. Still, in the hearts of those who refuse to surrender, the flame of justice flickers, inspiring tireless quests to unveil the face of evil that snuffed out the lives of six innocent souls. For within the heart of this horrific tragedy, lies a chilling truth, a malevolence so profound that it dared to extinguish the light of life in the most callous and ignoble manner. As we navigate the murky depths of the Hinterkaifeck murders, we find ourselves grappling with the unanswerable question, who or what was the embodiment of this wickedness that forever scarred the hallowed halls of that secluded farmstead? Thanks for watching. If you found this video fascinating, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Let us know in the comments if there are any other unsolved mysteries you'd like us to explore. And as always, prioritize your safety. Until next time.